My background, very shortly, is that I have been working with uh, vegetable production systems, organic vegetable production systems for many years, working with cover crops and uh, uh, green manures and how we optimize, improve the effects of them, uh, doing a lot of work on crop and cover crop root growth and how we can use that to improve uh, cropping systems. I have, uh, I'm from the University of Copenhagen, as it was just said, I'm a professor of crop science there, but all the research I'm going to present has been uh, funded by ICROPS, which is uh, the Danish-based international organization for uh, organic farming research. Um, I guess most of you don't know it, but, but uh, uh, some of you may know the organic e-prints, which is actually organized from there. Um, so but I'll use the uh, ICROFs uh, logo here, but uh, oh, so we're going a bit fast. <laughs> yeah, just to show uh, this is my daily work uh, place. Um, I'm going to show results from two uh, um, rotation studies, um, and the, the main one I'll show results from. Uh, was a recent one we, we did and some of the background for doing it is that we have a lot now we've just seen a lot of results showing how organic farming does a number of things better than conventional farming when we look at environment and, and, and other things. But I mean you can do organic farming in many ways. When consumers go and pay a premium for organic products or when politicians decide to use money for support or for public canteens as was just mentioned or Otherwise, they, they expect they have some ideas about what they are, why they are paying extra, what are, what are they getting for their extra money. But are, can we act, does organic farming actually always deliver that? Would they, if they saw what was going on on the farms, would they then agree that they were actually buying what they thought they were buying? That's an interesting question, and I think uh, one of the risks is that when organic farming is developing from a small niche to to a, a, a a big commercial sector, are we losing some of these uh, things? So that was some of the background for doing this study. And some of what we tried is because one, some of the things always said in organic farming is that we try to rely more on the on-farm resources, the internal resources of the system rather than inputs. But when you look at all these studies and when you go and look at many organic farms, they actually use a lot of inputs, also in terms, for instance, of organic matter bought from outside the farm and so on. I've seen a number of results here showing a, a large uh, phosphorus surplus on the, the organic farms and that tells me that these organic farms import a lot of organic matter from outside so they have a lot of input. Uh, and we also tr would want, wanted here to try to work with more diverse systems in the hope of improving, uh, improving biological control in, in, in the systems. Uh, much of the design of this um, rotation study was based on a previous studies and a previous rotation study where we actually grew for eight years a vegetable rotation where we did not import any sort of manure and nutrients at all. We tried with strategies for using green manures, cover crops, uh, using deep rooted crops uh, to, to reduce leaching losses. To, uh, to make this system self-sufficient maybe in, in, in nitrogen. And we did not do it by, uh, um, by exchanging half of the cash crops by green manures. We tried to have an intensive production system but where we, we did, um, uh, did a better nutrient management. And we were actually successful for eight years to produce good vegetable yields without adding any fertilizers from outside. Um, and what did we learn from that that could be, be used? One of the things we, uh, we learned was that uh, in, in this type of, of rotations, at least in, in Europe, it, it is typical to use like one year of green manure and then produce cash crops for three years and then back to green manure again. That is a system that has been tried, I think, for, for many decades uh, and it can work, but it also, uh, like, it, it's a big cost to take out a, a quarter of your land area just to grow green manure. And then you have a lot of nutrients for the first following crop, but the third one don't get much. So it's, it's not an ideal system. And here we try to have only the full year green manure once out of six years and then use it before the very uh, nutrient demanding vegetable crops like leek and cabbage, that's what you see on the, on the two lower um, 
uh, bars here. Uh, where we had less demanding uh, uh, vegetables, we, we grew only an autumn green manure, as I call it. That was clover grass uh, undersown into a cereal. So after cereal harvest, this would grow as a green manure and be clawed under uh, in the early spring, and then we have the vegetables. One of the big surprises of this experiment, looking across the years, was that these two things, these two ways of growing green manure, seemed to have more or less the same effect of nitrogen supply. Uh, what you can see, the, the green part of these bars is what the nitrogen we found in the crop. And the black part is what we found in the soil after harvest. And you can see the crops are different in efficiency. Cabbage is very efficient. Practically all the nitrogen is in the crop, little, no, nothing in the, in the soil. Onion is the other way around. It takes to up about half of what was there left a lot in the soil. But when you see the total, we had the same amount of nitrogen in the system, whether we had used the whole year for green manure or we had used the previous year for a cereal crop and then just the autumn for green manure. So that, that has led me to the conclusion that such an autumn green manure is really a very efficient thing to do compared to a full year green manure, also because you can do it more often in your rotation uh, because you don't take up the room for uh, the land from a, a cash crop. Another thing that we so saw we, we tried in this system to have autumn cover of the soil as often as possible. But you can, of course, not always do that. When we have, when we have late harvested vegetables under Danish conditions, it makes no sense to, to sow a cover crop in mid-September. That's too late. It, it, it will grow and establish, but it will do no good. So there was a number of situations where we could, uh, did not establish a, a cover crop. And the blue points here on, the, on this graph show what we found there. When we measured uh, soil nitrogen in November, you can see it varies from like 30 to 160 kilograms of nitrogen, depending on the year and the crop. Very variable. And if the, the red line shows the one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. So, so um, I, I need it like a pointer. Uh, but um, when the points are below this line, there was more nitrogen in the soil in November than there was next year in May. And you can see practically all of these points are below, uh, below the line, showing that we had a lot of nitrogen loss in the autumn during the winter, and we had less nitrogen when we, our next crop needed it than had been in the soil. Then when we did soil cover, and this is a lot of different types of cover, that is full year green manure, short term green manures, fodder radish cover crops, and even the most special one we did was where we had the cabbage crop. When you harvest the cabbage crop, you don't kill off the plant, actually. You, you, you harvest the, the cabbage head, but the plant is, is still alive. So we just left that to grow, regrow after harvest to be a catch crop after itself. So all the green points coming up here, they are the effect when we had soil cover. It's very different, these very different types of soil cover. But you can see they all did the same thing to the soil. They moved the timing of soil of nitrogen availability from the autumn, where we don't need it, to the spring, where we really like to have the nitrogen available for the crops. You can see from the lower of them, it's not like all of these covers were extremely efficient in delivering a lot of nitrogen. Some of them are at the same level as the blue points, but still they show a situation with much less uh, leaching risk and a much better timing of nitrogen availability. And some of the points, if you take the points up to the uh, top, uh, top left of this graph, they are really ideal. That's how we want it to be, nothing in the soil in the autumn and a, a, a good nitrogen supply for our crop in the spring. So soil cover works. Um, and then I have mentioned already some, a number of times deep rooted crops and when we have nitrogen leaching and we cannot avoid nitrogen leaching and the blue points I showed you in the graph before, that's situations where we have a lot of leaching but we often tend to think of leaching as something either we have the nitrogen in the soil or it's leached or lost and lost. But leaching is a gradual process. It's a movement of nitrogen down through the soil. So at what time is it actually lost? How deep does it have to go in the soil before it's lost? And that depends on the root depth of our crops. So if we can grow deeper rooted crops, they can actually go down and mop up some of the nitrogen that would be lost if we had grown other crops that are deep in the soil. In this case, it's just a, a simple study where we compare two, two cover crops. Uh, here, it's, uh, these two lines are two years of ryegrass cover crop root growth during the autumn. And during an autumn period, it reached down to about 
80, 90 centimeters depth in the soil. A fallow radish reached more than two meters at actually uh, the, the maximum measurement depth of our system was 2.4 meters. So some of these fallow radish have been even deeper than that. So there's a lot of deep, if, if we had had leaching here, there was a lot of deep nitrogen that would be available for the fallow radish, which the ryegrass would never have any chance to take up. So that is part of the strategy to grow, grow deep rooted crops where we know we have leaching risk. And then I like uh, to show this one because we often worry in organic farming, can we have nitrogen available early in the spring, especially in, under northern conditions like in Denmark, the soil is cold, can we have nitrogen mineralizing when we come with animal manures, do they release the nitrogen early enough? And this is just a picture from one of my experiments with cover crops showing that what we also have showed with measurements, that cover crops can release their nitrogen very fast even in a cold soil. Uh, so we, they are actually a good source of early nitrogen to combine with maybe slower releasing um, manures and things like that. So now to, to this um, uh, rotation study we did recently. And in this case uh, we compared a conventional system to three different kinds of organic systems. And the idea is, of course, to show that organic is not just organic. It depends how we do it. Uh, we can improve on that. And, um, but in, in the, we, had, um, we had the same crop rotation of, of cash crops. Uh, and then we had an organic system, the one called O1 here, which is really an in input-driven organic system. It's, it's based on most of the nutrition is based on import of, of manure from outside. The O2 and O3 systems, we have uh, as instead a cover crop, catch crop, uh, green manure strategy where we try to keep track of, of the nitrogen and, and, and uh, make that available uh, as just shown. Um, and especially in the O3 system, we also try to do some intercropping I'll come back and, and, and show that. But if you look at, at the numbers on the lower line, you can see that the, the, the fertilizer input of nitrogen to these systems was extremely different from uh, about 150 kilograms per hectare uh, at, in the conventional system to 94 in the first organic system to less than 30 in the, the two last organic systems. So it, the, the input level here is really different. Um, the rotations, uh, I won't go through it in detail, but the very simple part is that uh, that we here, it was a rather simple rotation. We had cereals every, every second year and then we had vegetables every second year. Um, we had the main rotation here was oats, onion, rye, cabbage, and then oats, carrot, rye, lettuce. So, and the idea was that we grew the rye where the, the vegetable was so late harvested that there we were not able to grow a cover crop. So then we could establish the winter rye instead. It wouldn't grow much in the winter, but in the autumn, but it, it would then be established for, for early spring growth. In the last column to, to the right, you can see uh, all the list of, of cover crops, uh, green manures we included in, in the, the O2 and O3 systems. So there we tried really to have covers uh, every autumn. I'll show you a few pictures from, from this. Uh, the first picture here you can see uh, a field plot with carrots and onions and in the foreground you can see uh, crops from the O2 system. The next crops behind it are from the, the conventional system. Um, and you can see that doesn't look very different. It looks very much the same. If you could look close at the picture you could see that the conventional system crops was a little bit darker green but apart from that uh, this picture shows uh, carrots in the O3 system where we have the intercrops. What we did was that, we, that the green manure established in the cereal the year before, we rotivated um, most of it away in the aut late autumn and again in, in spring, but we left uh, rows of, in, of, of this uh, green manure growing. And then in the spring we, we established uh, vegetables uh, between these rows. So you can see here one row of intercrop, two row of, of, of crops. Um, and you can see uh, other examples here, the, the cabbage also with the, with the intercrop. 
A main driver in this system, as I have mentioned a lot of times already, is, is the, uh, the green manures and cover crops. Um, here you can see this is, uh, at, at this plot we had harvested rye. So this is red clover growing after rye. Uh, so you can see even in a short season like the, like the Danish uh, season, we can, we can get a very strongly developed uh, green manure uh, just in the autumn sometimes. The different crops respond differently here. It's the green manure growing after oat harvest, and oat is much more um, competitive towards, the, uh, towards the, the, the green manure that is under sown, so we get a much weaker development. Uh, in this case, it's okay because it's also where we follow up with the vegetables that are not so demanding. And this is a picture of the last uh, cover crop we used, the fodder radish we used after uh, lettuce harvest. You can see the, the, this one in, in the foreground and, and the cabbage is still growing uh, behind it. A few more words about this intercropping system. Um, the idea was, I think in many of this sort of intercropping systems where you want to build better conditions for natural uh, pest regulations, you will sow your intercrop or plant your intercrop more or less at the same time as you sow your main crop. Meaning that at the time the main crop is establishing, there's no effect of the, of the intercrop yet. And that's actually a critical period. So, so a, a main idea here was, as you can see on the picture, the just trans transplanted lettuces between uh, uh, rows of intercrop that have been there actually already for a year. So there's a habitat for insects that has already been a chance to build up uh, populations. So, so they can affect pest dynamics in the field right from crop start. Another aspect that is illustrated in this picture is that uh, we have some flowering elements in these intercrops and I think that is very important uh, if you want to improve insect dynamics and that is here you can see a little bit of flowering. That is actually one of the things we did not do very well. If I have to redo this experiment, I would put much more emphasis on getting different flowering uh, components into the intercrop. Uh, but there was some. And then I don't know if you can see that, but my point of showing this picture is that when we do this, we can of course not control everything that is growing there. We are sowing something, but weeds and other plants are just uh, obviously appearing and when we were looking at that we could see a lot of insect dynamics going on also on some of the plants that were not intended to be there but, but still had an effect just showing that that more diversity is, is probably uh, good in many ways. Um, then on to the vegetable yields. Uh, you can see here of course different crops have different yield levels and in this case the carrot and the cabbage crops are much more productive than the onions and especially the lettuces. I don't know what happened to the axis out there. It didn't look like that when I made it at home. Um, when you look across the crops, the two O1 and O2 systems, they produced 81% uh, of what we harvested in the conventional system. That's not quite as impressive as some of the other results I have seen here, but I think for a system like this and for uh, for our conditions, this is actually a very good result. We have nice yields, and you can see that the two, the O1 and O2 system, are yielding exactly the same. So even though we put practically no fertilizer into the O2 system, we still keep exactly the same yield level. Of course, the O3 system, where every third vegetable row is uh, changed to a, an intercrop row, uh, we have a lower yield. But when you, if you calculate, if you compensate. If, if you correct for that, you can see, you will see that the, the yield of the, this, the single vegetable row or vegetable plant is actually the same as in O1 and O2, meaning that of, though we of course get less yield per hectare because we use some of the space for the intercrop, we actually are able to grow perfectly good vegetable crops also in this intercropping system. So, so it's a, it, it can be performed in a, in a good way. Um, Another thing that is always worth to remember, when we compare yield levels in organic and conventional farming systems, some crops are very easy to work with organically and you can get much the same yields as in conventional farming. In this case, the carrots, we had 91% of the yield in organic compared to conventional. We have other results where we actually found that we could get exactly the same yields. So this was even a little bit disappointing. With onion, we got only 72 and I think there are various good reasons. I cannot explain all of it, but there are various good reasons. That's what Danish farmers see, that they cannot keep the same yield levels. So depending on which crops, if we had made this study only with onion and lettuce, we would have 
uh, we would have found some more um, uh, discouraging results than if we had focused on cabbage and carrot. Um, well, I think I'll have just sort a uh, uh, five minutes sign, so I'll skip a little bit, but this is just to illustrate the the nitrogen balance I put balance in in, in um, what are they called? But I, but this is not a balance, of course. This is just showing what did we put in as fertilizer compared to what did we harvest. And you can see the conventional system. We put in much more than we harvest in the two O2 and O3 systems. With the cover crops, we put in much less. Uh, this works still because we have less losses and we have the nitrogen fixation. So therefore, it, it still works. But but looking at at balances, it's very changed. This is a complicated figure. I don't expect you to go through all of it. Uh, it shows root distribution of all the crops at harvest. Um, and my point of showing it is to show you how different the crops actually are. If you see the heavy red line in the top, that is onions. They have a very shallow rooting, practically not a single root below half a meter. Most of the roots are up in the top uh, 30 centimeters or something like that. Then we have a lot of other crops in uh, intermediate here, lettuces, uh, oats, carrots, and so on. They, they have uh, their roots distributed mainly in the top meter or meter and a half. And then we have the other extreme, the blue and the black curves that you can see easily at the bottom of the figure, uh, representing uh, cabbage and the fall radish cover crop. Uh, crops that have almost the same root density at harvest or at the end of their growing season in two and a half meters depth that they have in in the upper soil layers. So these are really crops that are able to exploit the soil in a very different way uh, and, and they are very uh, efficient in, in using what is in the soil. I tried to calculate this in, in another way because one of the things we have heard a few examples during the last two days that in some of these studies uh, there have been plots laid out with pasture, permanent pasture, or even just left to, uh, to grow back to na nature. And people have been able to show that that has some good environmental effects. But unfortunately, it doesn't produce any food. Uh, what is really interesting is, can, can, we combine, can we combine some of these good effects? Can we put some more of them into the, the, the cropping systems? And here, if you look at the upper, this is simply root depth over time during these rotations. And if you look at the upper, one, it's in the conventional system. And you can see first you have a short period with oats root growth, and you have many months with no roots in the soil. Then you have uh, onion or carrot, and then you have a period again, and so on. So you have a lot of the deep soil is only rooted a very short part of the time, and even the top soil is without roots for a long part of the, of the time. Uh, I tried to calculate this into a root exploitation. How many percent of the soil is rooted for how much of the time? Uh, and in, in the, the O2 system with the cover crops, it's not because the roots grew very different from the conventional system, but we have much more roots through much more time because of the cover crops. So when we try to calculate it, if you see on, on the, on the soil, total soil uh, volume that we, we studied, in the conventional system there were only roots for 21 percent of the time. It's very low, but I think it's very typical for many farming systems. In the, in the organic system, we have, we have almost doubled it. And if you see on, on the, the last uh, column, you can see that in the deeper soil layer, the differences were even bigger. I think in such a, a, a perennial system, these numbers would have been 100 percent or close to 100 percent. So we was not able to do something like the, the, the a natural system, but we took a big step in that direction without um, leaving the, the, the uh, uh, without dropping the crops that are actually producing our food and, and produce. When we looked at what how this affected uh, soil um, soil nitrogen, I here just took hours across the whole rotations, um, and you can. If you look at it, you can, you can see that the, the left-hand figure is uh, data for, for the spring situation. The right hand is for the autumn situation. And in both cases, you can see that the nitrogen distribution in the soil, in the conventional and the O1 system, these two, they follow each other. They have much higher uh, subsoil nitrogen contents than, uh, than the O2 and O3 systems. 
So putting in, getting this, taking this step closer to how a natural system works actually helped us a lot on managing nitrogen, uh, nitrogen better. And what you can see is that it's not the difference between conventional and organic that is the big difference here. It's the difference is between some of the organic systems, whether we use the cover crops to manage nitrogen better. So it's, it's not get, getting good just automatically by doing it organically. I think my time is really running out. So I just mentioned that this study was part of a big project where we did a lot of other things, food quality studies, uh, looking at contents of various things, uh, serving the vegetables to a taste panel. We did, uh, there were studies where these products were used for, for health studies, both in humans and in, in, in rat studies. Um, a lot of things were studied in the field, insect dynamics uh, and, and other things. I'll just show one single example because we tried to use the modern method called proteomics and I, I'm sure some of you know it. it it's, a, it's a method where, where you can you extract the proteins from, from the plant and by some things I will not try to explain to those of you who don't know them already, you can, you can separate them and you can visualize them on, on a, a gel. And in this case, we were able to, to measure, to, to quantif uh, quantify between 1,500 and 2,000 proteins from, from the two crops we were looking at, the cabbage and the carrot. Um, and then we looked at all these, I think if, if, we, if we think organic products are to be different in health effect, taste, physiology, something, the protein expression, is, which is a direct thing the genes are doing in the, in the plant, they must be affected. When we looked at all these, just are any of these affected? It was a, a, a low percentage that were affected. It was three, four, five percent of the proteins that were quantitatively uh, affected. So it was so low that you might say this could be just coincidence. But when we looked into the details, it was clear that it was not just coincidence. What you can see here is just a little cut out uh, of these gels with showing one or two protein spots um, and you can see the four different systems and the three replicates that were tested and you can see to the right that in this case with this specific protein the O3 system had higher expression of, of this chlorophyll protein than the three other systems. To me this is impossible to explain but some of the, some of the few uh, effects we saw were actually quite interesting and were starting to tell us something about how our plants physiology, physiologically uh, changed when you grow them organically and there was, I, I think there's quite an, an interesting story uh, in, in, in such a study. So we can also use uh, some of the modern methods to, to try to, to understand this better. Thank you for your attention.